This week on the A Push Show, we are looking at Chapter 7, the Jeffersonian era. We're going to look at the rise of cultural nationalism. Can we really have a single cultural nationalism? We have so many different types of people here. Can we have one? I don't know. Let's find out. There will be stirrings of industrialism. Will people change the way they work and how they buy stuff? I don't know. Let's find out. We'll talk about Jefferson the president. Was he a good guy? Was he a bad guy? Was he a federalist? Was he a Republican? What was he? I don't know. We're going to find out. We're going to talk about doubling the national domain. America's going to get a whole lot bigger. But what is that going to mean? I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. There's also going to be expansion and war as natives and the British are not going to be too keen on the United States expanding. Who will win that war? Probably us. And lastly, we'll talk about the war of 1812. Gee, I wonder what year that occurred. I don't know. I guess we'll just find out this week on the A Push Show. section of the book talks about the rise of cultural nationalism and developing a sense of a cultural nationalism or an American identity is kind of hard considering the fact that the United States is a nation of immigrants living on land that was more or less stolen or coerced from the people already living here. Also, don't forget we had over a million people living as slaves who were legally separated from society. So the idea of a national culture is a very complex one. It kind of reminds me of what Walt Whitman, the poet, said when he said, I am large, I contain multitudes. And he might as well have been talking about the United States because the United States is incredibly large with a multitude of culture and people. And sometimes it can be difficult to find patterns of cultures that extend across these multitudes. Regardless, the book identifies that the early American Republic during the time of Jefferson began to reflect the Republican vision of America with a heavy emphasis on agriculture, but also embracing education and enlightenment rationalism. But these ideas often conflict with one another. Jefferson and his Republicans believed in the idea of a virtuous citizenry, which meant a public that operated with a sound moral compass and also an education. They advocated for a nationwide network of public schools to educate the future white males that would one day lead the nation. Sorry, women, black people, natives, and anyone who isn't considered a white man, you're not considered a part of this virtuous citizenry. However, by 1815, not a single state had a working public school system. They all do now, but some state school systems are a little bit better than others. Without public schools, private schools filled the role of educating the nation's youth. In the North, private schools were largely secular, whereas in the South and Mid-Atlantic region, most schools are run by religious groups. However, these schools were expensive and were therefore only available to the wealthy. The poor had little to no options for an education. Many people received education in small one-room schoolhouses where children ranging in the ages of 8 to 18 were often taught in the same room. A basic instruction was usually given involving literacy, arithmetic, government, and perhaps some history and science. In the 18th century, most schools were cut off from women, but as the idea of a Republican motherhood grew more popular, people realized the need to have literate mothers so they could raise literate children. In 1789, Massachusetts required public schools to serve females as well as males, but the idea that women had the same intellectual abilities as men was still seen as a radical belief. Early advocates for feminism, like Judith Sargent Murray, would inspire future feminists with their essay in 1784, arguing the intellectual equality of women and men. In terms of teaching the natives, there was a belief held by Thomas Jefferson and his followers that the natives could be tamed via education. However, the white government did not feel it necessary to create public schools for natives, and the only educational opportunities that existed came in the form of missionary schools. 
African Americans were either actively denied education or not given an education by white governments. Most slave owners worked to block access to educational materials from their slaves out of fear of uprisings. However, there were some slaves who managed to become educated anyway, but their numbers were very few. As for higher education, that is college, very few Americans were able to gain access. Of the 22 colleges that existed in 1800, none of them were public and relied on private donations and tuition, which meant most people could not afford them. And to be honest, most people didn't really need much of an education as the only jobs that required a college education back then was being a member of the clergy. Almost all other jobs were learned through apprenticeships, which means you just kind of work for the person whose job you wanted to have. If you wanted to be a shoemaker, you worked for a guy who was a shoemaker. If you wanted to be a lawyer even, you worked for a guy who was a lawyer. If you wanted to be a veterinarian, you worked for a guy who was a veterinarian. And you might encounter creatures like this. A eh, Taft? Moving on to the practice of medicine. The practice of medicine in the colonies was still very simple and downright dangerous back then. Most doctors were trained by apprenticeship, and many still adopted old and false practices that caused more harm and good. People still frowned upon the use of cadavers to study anatomy, and the practice of humorism, that is the four different humors or liquids in somebody's body, and subsequent bleeding and purging that came with humorism was still frequently used. Even famous American Dr. Benjamin Rush of Rush Medical Center in Chicago, massive, gigantic building that says Rush on it, advocated for bleeding and purging. In fact, it's believed that George Washington probably died as a result of a cure via bleeding and purging for a throat infection. Doctors also began to advocate for the elimination of midwifery. Remember, midwives are people who aid in childbirth, almost always women. This had two effects. One, it decreased the amount of available careers for women, and two, it caused more poor women to die from childbirth as many could no longer afford medical care because doctors were much more expensive than midwives. As the nation gained independence, many American intellectuals desired to develop a unique and independent American culture that could rival the cultures of Europe. One attempt made by a schoolmaster and lawyer from Connecticut named Noah Webster was to establish a simplified and Americanized system of spelling. Before this, spelling was kind of whatever you wanted it to be, which is why when you read old texts, the spelling is very funky and very inconsistent. We still have Webster's dictionaries today to remind us what words mean and how to spell things the American way, which included not putting you in words that end with the phoneme O-R. Yeah, England. There you are, right there. And right there. You hear that? We're not putting yous in our words. And I bet you'd like to endeavor to stop us, but your labor hours would be fruitless as we are now independent. It's also worth noting that Canada still uses the British spelling because they're not revolutionary guys. Are they, Taft? No, they're not. Americans also tried to establish their own unique literary style, but met with limited success in doing so at that time. One of the more successful American authors in terms of the tests of time was early Republic writer Washington Irving, who wrote about the early rustic American characters like Ichabod Crane in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. But a growing body of American literature grew as the society from which it became also blossomed. One of the more identifiable aspects of culture, religion, also began to develop in unique ways that reflected the diverse and dynamic nature of American life at this time. One effect of the revolution was a weakening belief in traditional Christian beliefs. Thanks in large part to the Enlightenment, people began to question aspects of the Bible and traditional religious dogma. Not that kind of dog, Taft. Dogma. For example, the deists believed that there was a god, but god was a remote being who had withdrawn from direct involvement in worldly affairs. As rationalism spread and church membership declined, many feared the moral decay of American society, but Americans still held deeply rooted religious beliefs which would be made apparent in the Second Great Awakening. As Taft falls asleep. So sleep. 
You may remember the first Great Awakening occurred in the 1730s and 1740s out of a response to a growing fear of a lack of piety and overall moral decay in society. Well, the Second Great Awakening kind of did the same thing in the 1790s. Worried that people weren't members of churches, church leaders fought the spread of religious rationalists like the Deists. Church denominations like Methodists and Baptists grew in huge numbers thanks in large part to large camp meetings modeled after the first camp meeting in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. These were large outdoor religious festivals, mostly held in the western frontier areas, where life was often especially harsh and the comforts of organized religion more readily accepted. For frontier people, the Great Awakening Camp Revival was basically one of the most exciting festival-type atmospheres one could experience at that time. Think like Lollapalooza or Coachella, but with way less commercialism, social media, way worse musical acoustics, and way, 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 way less drugs and alcohol, but a whole lot more Jesus. The basic message of the Great Awakening was difficult to find as there were many messages and denominations, but the overall pattern we see in the message is a belief in achieving grace and salvation through faith and good works. Women in particular took to the Great Awakening as they sought solace in a rapidly changing world around them. Many women were working more increasingly in factory type jobs which were at that time very unfamiliar and many women struggled to find husbands and many men ventured west leaving many women sort of out of luck in terms of finding marriage prospects. Religion was a way to help find stability in this dynamic world for them. African Americans Interestingly enough, we're also allowed to participate in camp revivals and heavily embrace the message of egalitarianism through faith that the revivals preached. Slave preachers would emerge out of the Second Great Awakening, and a slave rebellion even emerged in Virginia as a result of slave revival meetings. This rebellion was known as Prosser's Rebellion, named for Gabriel Prosser. The black church after that would be a source of complexity for the South, as it was a source of Christian belief, but also a source of ideas regarding black emancipation and also coded language regarding achieving black freedom. Some Native Americans also took to the ideas of the Second Great Awakening as many sought grace in the face of crisis because of frequent encroachment on their lands by whites. Missionary work by Baptists and Presbyterians also succeeded in a great deal of Native conversions. Those who did not accept the ideas of the Second Great Awakening, aka free thinkers, found themselves somewhat ostracized by the dominant Christian community that was firmly entrenched by the early 1800s. However, the free thinkers did not entirely disappear. In the early 1800s, America and the rest of the world was on the precipice of a massive change in the human condition as the Industrial Revolution was beginning to take shape. America would adopt these practices in regards to labor and production wholeheartedly later on in the 19th century, but early adoptions of English technological advances would have large impacts on the American economy. One industry that began to industrialize was textiles. Textiles is anything made out of cloth. Clothes, sheets, curtains, anything made out of cloth. New textile technology came over across the Atlantic from the United Kingdom, but textiles need cotton, and cotton production at that time could not match the demand from textile factories of the North. Removing the seeds from the cotton bowls was extremely time-consuming, and cotton farmers could not meet the demand of textile manufacturers in the North. Enter Eli Whitney, a Yale-educated tutor from Massachusetts who invented a solution while working as a tutor on a plantation of the Revolutionary War hero, Nathaniel Green. His simple machine, the cotton gin, named it gin because that's the old-timey southern way of saying engine, engine exponentially increased the ability to produce cotton. This would transform the economy of the South as slave labor, which was actually dwindling in importance as a source of labor, would regain its importance in the production of cotton. The North would become increasingly industrialized as the production of cotton allowed Northern entrepreneurs to move away from agriculture and more toward industrialism via textiles. Having resources and the ability to churn out finished goods is all fine and dandy, but one needs also to have access to people who will buy those goods. That means markets. The United States got access to European markets in the 1790s as war broke out in Europe and people needed goods that American merchants were ready to provide. Between 1790 and 1810, American shipments to Europe increased nearly tenfold. In addition to increasing the American presence in markets in Europe, Americans increased access to domestic markets. 
preference was given to American ships in American ports, and in 1807, a new steamboat powered with the new invention of the steam engine allowed ships to travel on American rivers regardless of the direction of the current. It was known as the steamboat. Big invention back then. Early forms of interstate travel emerged during the late 18th century as well. These were the first attempts at roads to connect large cities and therefore markets. You had to pay a toll to a private company who built the road in order to travel on the road, which consisted of finely crushed and hard-packed rock. However, because it was privately owned, roads were rather short in order for them to be profitable. And they were called turnpikes because it's named for the device to hold people from further travel until they paid their toll. The turnpikes allowed horse-drawn carriages to travel more easily regardless of weather. Because back then, most roads were made out of dirt, which meant if it rained, you didn't really travel. This is a pre-train era, nearly a century before any sort of automobiles would be around. So horse-drawn carriages were still the best way to travel by land. That's right. The human race failed to improve upon the horse as a means of land-based transport for nearly 3,000 years, if not more. <coughs> Shut up, Taft. Like cats could invent anything better. What have cats ever invented? <coughs> oh, they have not. In 100 years, the U.S. expanded heavily. In 1700, we see the non-native settlement isolated in a few coastal cities. By 1800, that same settlement expanded into the interior and along a few river systems. Though the U.S. went through a great deal of change in the early days, it was still a heavily agrarian nation, and cities were relatively small when compared with their European counterparts. But cities grew and grew, and soon cities like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and Baltimore boasted populations of tens of thousands of people. The cities became centers of affluence, and with this affluence came the desire for entertainment like music, theater, dancing, and a growing entertainment, horse racing. The cities fulfilled pretty much all of those things. Which brings us to the now increasingly maligned and incredibly complex historical figure of Thomas Jefferson. His hard-fought victory over John Adams in the election of 1800 was deemed to be a great revolution to Jefferson in private, but publicly he tried to bridge the bitter divide between Federalists and Republicans. In fact, many of his policies would be heavily Federalist, especially in terms of what he did to expand American territory. Jefferson was the first president in the brand new city of Washington, D.C. The designers of the city were hoping it would be the Paris of America, but neither Rome nor Paris were built in a day, and Washington, D.C. had a lot of days to go. Many members of the Congress and the Senate hated going to Washington to do business of lawmaking, and some would leave mid-session to take a post in their state legislatures if it meant they got to leave the uncivilized and swampy construction project that was Washington, D.C. at that time. However, Jefferson tried to embody the rugged nature of the capital and the people of his nation. Jefferson was an extraordinarily wealthy, educated, and cultured owner of over 100 slaves. It's also worth noting one of those slaves we now know for a fact he had fathered children with and that he refused to acknowledge those children. He also was, by all accounts, a brilliant talker and writer, as well as an architect, educator, inventor, and philosopher. Amazing what one can do when he has a bunch of slaves to take care of most of his stuff for him. But Jefferson was also a brilliant politician. He did exactly what he had criticized the Federalists for doing, which is stacking federal jobs with loyal Republicans, and he easily won his bid for re-election in 1804 over the Federalist candidate Charles Pickney. Jefferson lived up to the Republican ideal of a weak central government by dramatically reducing the amount of taxes the government collected and limiting the government debt by limiting the amount of things the government had to spend money on. This was basically the opposite of what the Federalists did. Jefferson ended the hated whiskey tax and government revenue was based solely on two things, sale of western lands and customs duties, which are basically taxes on imported goods. He also dramatically reduced the staffs of the federal government to bare bones necessities and cut the size of the army almost in half from about 4,000 to 2,500. He reduced the navy from 25 ships to 7. He worried that an army could impose on the rights of citizens and a navy would encourage overseas trade, whereas he preferred the nation focus on agriculture. 
However, he did establish West Point, which was to become our nation's foremost military academy. Don't tell any Navy people that. Jefferson's reduction in the Navy somewhat cost him when a conflict arose with the Barbary Pirates. The Barbary Pirates were a group of countries in northern Africa near the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea that would use their position to basically extort countries that wished to get in and out of the Mediterranean. The Pirates were pretty skilled and ruthless, and most countries, the U.S. included, opted to just pay the protection money rather than fight them. Jefferson didn't want to do that anymore, so he began to move towards war with the pirates, and the pirates thusly declared war on the United States in 1801 by taking some U.S. prisoners and cutting down the flagpole of the American consulate in North Africa. Though Jefferson would build a fleet to fight the pirates, the U.S. never really did, and the U.S. agreed to pay a humiliating ransom to free their U.S. prisoners. Jefferson's role was profound in the judicial conflict between Federalists and Republicans that would establish the process of judicial review and position the judicial branch with nearly equal footing with the legislative and the executive. Now, I'm just going to warn you, this next part is very heavy in terms of political science and legal stuff, so try to follow along as best you can. I'll try to make Make it as clear as possible, though. So it all started back with John Adams' Federalists and the Judiciary Act. The Federalists lost the election for president and most of the seats in Congress in the election of 1800. In the space between the election and the inauguration of President Jefferson and the now Republican-dominated Congress, Adams appointed a ton of Federalist judges to keep one of the branches of government, the judicial, in the power of Federalist hands. However, when Jefferson became president, the commission to make these positions official had not been delivered. So Jefferson's Secretary of State, James Madison, decided to just not deliver the commissions. Needless to say, the Federalist judges were pissed, and one of the judges, William Marbury, appealed to the Supreme Court. The court made a somewhat unexpected but massively important decision. They decided that Marbury had a right to his commission, but the court had no authority to tell the executive branch what to do when it came to delivering commissions. Their reason was that the judiciary's power was clearly defined in the Constitution and Congress had no right to expand these powers. Marbury would not receive his commission, and this seems like a big victory for the Republican administration. Right, Taft? <coughs> Wrong! The judiciary branch took a slight step backwards to take a massive leap forward. It denied its power to force the delivery of commissions, but gained the power to nullify acts of Congress that are unconstitutional. Ooh, real smart. Now Congress could pass a law, but the Supreme Court could strike it down if it was deemed to be unconstitutional. All of this was the brainchild of Justice John Marshall, a former Secretary of State of the John Adams administration and a titan of American law. A few law schools and a ton of high schools are named for old Johnny Judicial Review Marsh. Jefferson recognized the threat of this newly assertive judicial branch and took the offensive. He tried to impeach Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase. By the way, impeach means to remove from office, not to throw in jail, and it has nothing to do with peaches. Samuel Chase was a heavily partisan justice who generally ruled according to his party's desires, not necessarily what the law stated. Jefferson wanted him out, and the only legal way to do that was via impeachment as Supreme Court justices served for life. However, Jefferson did not have enough votes to get to two-thirds needed in the Senate, and Chase remained on the Supreme Court. Though Jefferson lost power against the judicial branch, he did gain a lot of land, an absurd amount of it, in fact. One could even venture to call it a crap ton of land. And he did it with the help of a French dictator who was actually Italian and was actually very average in height for his time. Napoleon was not that short. That was a bit of British propaganda to make him mad. And guess what? It worked. In the wake of the chaos of the French Revolution, a commander of the French army, Napoleon Bonaparte, took charge. He named himself Emperor of France and waged war with much of Europe. He also wanted to expand his influence in the New World. One way he tried to do that was to solidify French holdings in the Caribbean and a massive tract of land called the Louisiana Territory in the Mississippi River Valley and beyond, which Napoleon had acquired from Spain. Napoleon attempted to address the slave rebellion in Santo Domingo, which is present-day Haiti, led by black freedman Toussaint Leverture. 
Can't believe I pronounced that correctly on the first try. What do you think of that, Taft? Well, you should care, because it's big time important. Napoleon sent an expedition to crush the rebellion, and it did, but only briefly, as disease would wipe out most of the rest of the French forces in the Caribbean. The rebels would regain control of Santo Domingo and rename their country Haiti. Well, Taff, we have no proof that anybody peed their pants because of that. No proof at all. So you can't really make that historical assertion now, can you? As this was happening, conflict arose in New Orleans between American shippers and the Spanish authorities there. Spain still controlled New Orleans because France hadn't formally transferred power yet. Things moved slowly back then. To stop the conflict, Jefferson offered to buy the massive Louisiana territory from France with a hint that if France refused, the U.S. would align themselves with France's enemy, England. As Napoleon's aspiration to control the New World seemed out of reach and renewed European war seemed near, he offered Jefferson a treaty to purchase the entire Louisiana Territory, a purchase which would more than double the size of the United States. After some brief haggling, American diplomats agreed to the treaty. The U.S. bought the Louisiana Territory for $15 million in 1803, which was about three cents per acre back then. This would be about $315 million today, or 63 cents per acre. Can you imagine, Taft? Can you imagine buying an acre for 63 cents? Well, of course you could. That's just literally double. I know you know. Jefferson acted quickly because he worried Napoleon would change his mind. Jefferson's quandary was whether or not this act was constitutional. He also had fearfulness as his whole political philosophy as a Republican went against government acts like this. However, this would also play perfectly into his ideal agrarian society because in order for a society to be agrarian, it needed land. And this was what my friends in the real estate business would call a poop ton of land. So Jefferson held his nose, signed the treaty under auspices that it would be allowable under the Constitution as the president could make treaties. The Republican-dominated Congress approved the treaty, and the U.S. was now a whole lot bigger. Though the U.S. now had this new piece of land, what was in it was still rather mysterious. So Jefferson commissioned two explorers in Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to learn what was in the Louisiana Territory, figure out the lay of the land, and perhaps establish friendly relations with the natives. See how that goes. To help them along their way, a Shoshone woman named Sacagawea guided them. In fact, without Sacagawea, the Lewis and Clark expedition would have probably been a fatal disaster for Lewis and Clark. Jefferson also sent explorer Zebulon Pike into the territory. Pike would be remembered as having failed to climb what is now known as Pike's Peak in Colorado and having made a very inaccurate impression that the land between the Mississippi River and Rocky Mountains was an uninhabitable desert, when in fact it is one of the most fertile stretches of land in the world. Zebulon Pike failed to climb Pike's Peak, but I didn't. I climbed it when I was three years old, and I have the photo to prove it. There you have it. I'm a better man than Zebulon Pike. <laughs> right, Taft? I know. Exactly. From savage wilderness, we now turn to the savage civilization with the Burr Conspiracy. If you're a big-time Alexander Hamilton stan, eesh, this next section might make you a little uncomfortable. Though many Americans were thrilled with the Louisiana Purchase, many Federalists were fearful that the new territory would result in them losing power. Some extreme Federalists, known as the Essex Junto, or Essex Junto, they probably didn't pronounce that J right because they probably didn't speak Spanish, wanted to secede from the United States and form a Northern Confederacy. However, they needed support from New York and New Jersey, and the leading New York Federalist Alexander Hamilton refused to comply. So, the Junto, or Junto, turned to Vice President Aaron Burr, who was also Hamilton's greatest rival. Rumors about Burr's support for the Junto, or Junto, from Hamilton, as well as attacks on his character, caused Burr to do what any sensible gentleman would do at that time, challenge someone to a gunfight. It was the gentlemanly thing to do back then. Kind of how Taff shakes my hand before I feed him. About to feed you. You're welcome. Sadly, Hamilton was mortally wounded in the duel, and he died the next day. 
Burr ran off as he was charged with murder. He joined an expedition to try and capture Mexico from Spain, but that expedition kind of turned into an alleged treasonous effort to take over New Orleans. Burr was captured, tried for treason and murder, had many pieces of evidence dismissed from the trial thanks to the efforts of Johnny Judicial Review Marshall, and was acquitted. The Burr conspiracy showed that the United States government had a long way to go before it would be a stable, united nation that could control all of its citizens and all of its territories. And that leads us to our next section on expansion and war. Massive expansion into the West thanks to a deal with Napoleon in 1803 is going to lead to two things, conflict and more conflict. Conflict because Napoleon is about to engage pretty much all of Europe in war, and conflict with the natives who were living on the land the U.S. had just purchased. Man, I can't believe European descendants would just buy and sell land that was occupied by people who had been living on it for thousands of years. That's so unlike them. For real? Word? Oof. We'll start with the Napoleonic Wars. As Napoleon began to wage war, England was one of his main nemeses. As a result, France blockaded England from trading with continental Europe, and England blockaded American merchant ships from traveling to Europe. America's predicament was that it could not trade without either France or England thus ruining the Jeffersonian position of neutrality. Americans would eventually choose against the British due to their practice of impressment. Being a British sailor back then was pretty awful. Their pay stunk, the ship conditions were lousy, and the floggings were lame. Because of that, British soldiers often deserted and joined American ships. To regain lost manpower, the British would seize American ships and often impress or force people to become sailors. The British claimed that they would only impress British deserters and British people who had immigrated to the United States, but in reality, they impressed anybody they could. This made Americans big mad. The American ship, the Chesapeake, was stopped by a British ship, the Leopard. You would. The Chesapeake refused to let the British board their ship, so the British opened fire and the Chesapeake surrendered. Four Americans were dragged onto the Leopard to be impressed into the British Navy, and Americans were furious when news of the incident spread back home. Jefferson demanded the British government disavow the officers responsible and compensate America for any losses from the incident, which Britain did. However, they would continue to impress, but not in a good way. To prevent political conflict, Jefferson attempted peaceable coercion, which means you use economics to try and get countries to do what you want. His tool was the embargo. In 1807, he banned all American ships from leading for any foreign port at all. Jefferson basically took his trade ball and went home. This succeeded in hurting the economies of Europe to a degree, but it hurt American trade way more. Americans entered an economic depression because of the embargo, but since most of the people hurt financially the most were Federalists, Jefferson wasn't super duper perplexed by it. However, it did prove to be a political catastrophe for the Republicans, and before Jefferson left office in 1808, because he served two terms, he repealed the embargo. Congress would pass the Non-Intercourse Act. Oh, grow up, Taft. Ha ha ha. Intercourse. It's not what it means. You need to grow up, please. No, you. The Intercourse Act allowed trade with all nations but France and England. This act would expire, and a new act would allow trade with France but not England. Napoleon was being nice to us, so we decided to be nice back. It's awfully nice of us. Meanwhile, problems emerged with the natives who were upset that white people were stealing their lands. Weird, right? Jefferson appointed William Henry Harrison, a veteran in fighting wars with the natives, as leader of the Indiana Territory. The natives would follow the lead of native leader Tecumseh. In 1801, Jefferson made an offer to the natives, become settled farmers and assimilate into white society, or move west of the Mississippi River. It was a real lose-lose offer for the natives. Either lose your land and your way of life, or the other option is to just lose your land. Jefferson thought this was a good deal since the natives were being so brutally swept aside by Harrison, the man Jefferson had appointed, he figured they might take the deal. Two native leaders would emerge to try and unite the native tribes to fight against white encroachment. Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh, who I had mentioned earlier. 
Tenskwatawa, a.k.a. the Prophet, was a religious figure who had recovered from alcoholism and inspired natives with his largely religious message of the evils of white culture. Along with the Prophet, native leader Tecumseh advocated against white encroachment by encouraging natives to unite against the white man. His strategy was to unite the tribes and establish a border at the Ohio River to separate white and native lands. England also involved themselves in this conflict as they worried about encroachment into Canada and supplied natives with weapons. As Tecumseh was south to try and bring more tribes into his confederacy, William Henry Harrison led 1,000 troops near the native capital of Prophetstown, named for Tenskwatawa the Prophet. After intense fighting near the Tippecanoe Creek that left massive casualties on both sides, the natives were driven out and Tecumseh's confederacy more or less was in ruins. Many natives still conducted violent raids on white settlements as retribution. Because of Canada's involvement in the conflict, Harrison and other western frontiersmen began to advocate for conquering Canada, which of course made Canada and its parent country, England, a little nervous. Meanwhile, Florida was proving to be a big problem for America. Fair point, Taft. Florida was not only a land that America wanted, but it was also an area ripe for hosting hostile natives, as well as an area of escape for slaves. After the conflict of Tippecanoe and now Florida, many Americans turned to fiery war-hungry politicians, a.k.a. war hawks, like Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Thanks to the events in the frontier as well as pressure of these politicians, President James Madison would declare war on England in 1812. And the War of 1812 would begin. Hey Taft, guess which year the War of 1812 started in? That is correct. England was fresh off a victory over Napoleon, or close to a victory over Napoleon, after Napoleon's legendarily disastrous campaign of Russia. America was full of war hawk energy, but England quickly put that energy down with early defeats on the seas and in Detroit as well as Fort Dearborn in what is now Chicago. Thanks to a sea battle in Lake Erie, the victory at Put-in Bay, the tide turned for the Americans. They were now able to successfully invade Detroit. During the fighting in Detroit, Tecumseh would die as he was now fighting as a brigadier general for the British Army. While this was all happening, an increasingly popular militia leader in the South was waging war against the Creek tribe because they had attacked white settlers. Andrew Jackson was beyond brutal as he slaughtered Creek women and children and thus broke Creek resistance. To reward his efforts, the U.S. government would appoint Andrew Jackson as a general in the U.S. Army. He then would invade Florida and seize the city of Pensacola. These victories just made the British angrier as they invaded the U.S. in full scale. They would invade Washington, D.C. and burn down several buildings, including the White House. The British would move up to take Baltimore, but because Americans sank ships to prevent further advancement, Britain couldn't get within good range for a bombardment. An American lawyer was on a British ship at that time as he was trying to secure the release of a prisoner. He watched the bombardment and watched the American fort at Baltimore prevail. He was so inspired, he wrote a song about it. The lawyer's name was Francis Scott Key, and the song was called The Star-Spangled Banner. The rest, as we say, is history. Americans would secure further victories in northern New York, and Jackson would secure a famous victory at the Battle of New Orleans in which he led a motley group of U.S. soldiers, militiamen, blacks, creoles, and pirates to victory against a battle-hardened British regiment. The battle cost 700 lives, wounded 1,400, and caused 500 to become imprisoned. It was a tremendous achievement for Jackson. Too bad it happened weeks after the British had already surrendered. Like I said earlier, news traveled real slow back then. Though the Battle of Put-in Bay and New Orleans were successful, most military efforts of the War of 1812 were humiliating defeats. Federalists in New England began to talk of secession and met at Hartford, Connecticut to discuss their grievances. They proposed seven new amendments to protect New England from the influence of the South and West. But as they made their case, news arrived of Jackson's victory in New Orleans. As many basked in the glow of victory, the Federalists wallowed in defeat, and the party was essentially dead from that point on. <laughs> 
The War of 1812 ended in the Dutch city of Ghent, where a treaty of the same name was signed. Americans agreed to drop the whole issue of impressment, as well as their desire to acquire Canada. Britain agreed to stop trying to create a native buffer state in the Northwest. The treaty was signed and honored by settlements along the U.S.-Canada border. The rush bago Agreement of 1812 called for the disarmament of the Great Lakes, and as a result, the U.S.-Canadian border became the longest unguarded frontier in the world. But as of October 6, 2020, we Americans are still not allowed in Canada because we are riddled with irresponsibility and disease. That's it for our chapter overview. Thank you guys for watching, and don't forget, we gotta keep pushing, G.